questions. I hope that um, you enjoyed the first session and I hope that um, what was discussed was clear. Um, I think before we kick off um, with the second session, I'd like to just do a quick refresh on the first session, just so that we are clear on, on, on the element of insurance, which is important um, for purposes of your practice, but also very important for purposes of your assignment. Um, so I'm going to move on to our slideshow. And and consider the um, uh, and and just do a bit of a, a refresh and a recap. So essentially, we we looked at two very important um, types of insurances, and that was uh, the legal practice indemnity insurance fund and the legal practice fidelity fund, the legal practitioners fidelity fund. Now, the legal practitioners indemnity insurance fund. Remember, we said covers or PI type claims that are brought against a practice. Essentially, um, it is in instances where, for example, an insured or an attorney allows a claim to prescribe. Now, um, we, we looked at, and it's very important that you note that there is a master policy, and it is very important that you consider everything that is covered in that particular policy. It is also important that you look at the limits of indemnity and the deductible in the schedule of that policy. Um, and remember that the limits of indemnity and the deductible is dependent by the number of partners in the firm at the date the cause of action arose. Um, also very important to remember is that the deductible applicable if an insured or if an attorney has a claim that is brought to the uh, Legal Pre Practitioners Indemnity Insurance Fund, um, there are different deductibles. So be cognizant of that particular schedule, um, uh, columns A and column B, understand the type of claim that is referred to the Legal Practitioners Indemnity Insurance Fund, understand which column that fits in. So if it's a prescribed RAF matter, column A will be applicable, but also be very mindful that if it is a prescribed MVA, uh, RAF matter, there is the additional loading fee that would be applicable over and above the deductible in the schedule. And that is premised on the fact that it is um, that, that the insured or the attorney has failed to implement and um, uh, 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 and to um, register with prescription alert. We also look, remember, at the exclusions, and it is very important that you understand in detail all the exclusions that are applicable under the Legal Practitioners Indemnity Insurance Fund. For example, remember we said cybercrime is not covered under the Legal Practitioners Indemnity Insurance Fund, in which is which is covered under 16O of the policy. Um, so you need to consider that and also consider what happens if you are a victim of cybercrime. So if the Legal Practitioners Indemnity Insurance Fund will not cover you, what then um, will happen. You could be exposed in your personal capacity. Alternatively, you could have additional insurance in place that would cover that particular loss. Um, in terms of the Legal Practitioners Fidelity Fund, remember we said that this deals with misappropriation of trust funds, but we uh, I stressed that this is a fund that is um, for the benefit of the public and not the profession because it doesn't provide any assistance to the attorney in the event that there is misappropriation of trust funds. The claim will still be brought against the attorney who has misappropriated the funds or the practice and they would have to satisfy the claim and to the extent that it will not be satisfied, it is only then that, that the Legal Practitioners Fidelity Fund becomes relevant. Okay, so we now move on and we need to understand that whilst we looked in detail at the Legal Practitioners um, Indemnity Insurance Fund and the Legal Practitioners Fidelity Fund, these are the not, not these are not the only insurances that an attorney needs to be mindful of and alive to. There are various other forms of insurances that you need to take note of. Um, for instance, uh, property insurance, um, insurance relevant to your building or to your office content, um, 
what happens in the event that there is a fire or lightning damages to, a lightning damage to your computers you need to have insurance to cater for that eventuality you may want to consider public liability insurance um, if a client attends at your premises and slips and falls um, whilst in your office do you have insurance to cater for the for, for, for any claim that may stem from that incident. Um, so liability cover where there is death, injury, illness to any person that you may become legally liable for, do you have insurance to cover those particular incidents? There is also insurance um, available in the market for loss of documents, and this is where um, documents that are kept at your premises are lost or damaged. Um, it could be as a result of fire, it could be as a result of theft. Um, do you have cover in place in order to replace those documents that have been lost? Um, there is also motor insurance that you need to perhaps consider or even, or even business interruption insurance. So these are other types of insurance um, that, that, that are available and that, it, that an insured or an attorney needs to be mindful for mindful of and consider discussing with your insurance broker when you consider your insurance portfolio okay so we now move on to what exactly is professional negligence so how do we define and how do we um uh, you know what exactly is professional negligence and the simple answer is it is where an attorney fails to perform their responsibilities to the required standard. And what is the consequence of professional negligence? The consequence is that you may be faced with a professional indemnity claim and you may incur financial losses. Financial losses, if there is a professional indemnity claim, you would be liable for a deductible payment. Deductible payment in terms of your primary insurer under the Legal Practitioners Indemnity Insurance Fund or in terms of your top-up insurance. Um, there is also, um, you know, if, if your, your, your insurance that is uh, in place does not satisfy the the full value of the proven claim, you may have to fork out um, funds in order to satisfy the balance of the claim. So it may have a financial implication as well. So how do courts define professional negligence? And the courts have said that a lawyer must possess the legal skill and knowledge that is ordinarily possessed by members of the profession. In the case of Hani versus Blackenberg, the court held that professional negligence is where an attorney fails to act with the ordinary skill of an attorney acting with reasonable care, or where an attorney breaches his duty of care to ensure the exercise of the degree of skill and care which might reasonably be expected of an average attorney. In Slomowitz versus Koch, the court further held that an attorney in carrying out his mandate was obliged to exercise the knowledge, skill and diligence to be expected of an average practicing attorney. Um, I get really worried with the reference of average practicing attorney because it almost appears that mediocrity is acceptable and I don't think that necessarily is the case. So I think as attorneys, we need to strive for a higher degree um, of care and we need to ensure that we we, we 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 diligent in the manner that we practice. So for the level of negligence to be actionable, the injured party must show that the attorney acts, that the attorney's acts were not merely the result of poor strategy, but that they were results of errors that no reasonable attorney would have made. And this basically, there, there is a lot that the courts have referenced um, in terms of what exactly is professional negligence. But I think that the case of Melanzana versus Goodrick and Franklin may be a very good example to illustrate exactly how the, 
you know what how the courts view professional negligence um the degree of care that attorneys need to exercise when dealing with a client's case and um it, it, it's a good it's a good reference to professional negligence. So it's a case that I'd like to just take you through. Um, Mrs. Melanzana, her husband, Mr. Melanzana, was fatally killed in a motor vehicle accident in 2004. As a result of the, as a result of his death, Mrs. Melanzana approached um, a firm of attorneys known as Goodrick and Franklin. Um, to pursue a claim against the RAF for loss of support um, due to the death of her husband. Goodrick and Franklin accepted the mandate, accepted the instruction by Mrs. Melanzana and um, undertook to proceed to um, pursue her RAF claim. Now, I think it's important to before we go any further to understand the facts of the accident and just to look at what exactly happened on the day 22nd of june 2004 so mr melanzana was the passenger in a truck um, and they were traveling towards an, in, an intersection. Now, the driver of this particular truck that Mr. Melanzana was traveling in was experiencing some difficulties with regards to his braking system. And as he was approaching this intersection, the truck driver realized that he wasn't in a position to stop the truck. So he was swaying from side to side. He was flashing his lights. He was wooting. Um, but the other vehicles failed to take cognizance of his warning signs. And as he approached the intersection, one of the, the, the there were three vehicles involved in this accident, and one of the vehicles executed a right hand turn. This caused the truck that Mr. Melanzana, that the truck that Mr. Melanzana was traveling in to um, collide and um, the truck t uh, tipped over and Mr. Melanzana was fatally killed. So based on this accident um, and the death of Mrs. Melanzana's husband, she approaches Goodrick and Franklin. Um, Goodrick and Franklin um, failed to pursue the claim against the RAF timelessly, and as a result thereof, the claim of Mrs. Melanzana prescribes. So Mrs. Melanzana then brings a claim against Goodrick and Franklin on the basis of her prescribed claim and um, alleges that they have been negligent in the, in, in the manner in which they exercised um, their duty and um, failed to ensure that, her, uh, that Mrs. Melanzana's claim was properly dealt with. So Goodrick and Franklin defend this particular matter and the matter proceeds to trial. Now, I'll just pause to add that Goodrick and Franklin do not notify the LPIIF of this particular claim. Um, they opt to defend this matter on their own and they proceed to trial um, without the assistance of the LPIIF. So the matter proceeds to trial and the issue of quantum and merits are separated and the claim proceeds on merits. Now, um, it is important to note that in the merit trial, there were two very important questions that needed to be answered. And that was, number one, was the defendant in this matter, being Goodrick and Franklin, were they negligent? Um, in dealing with the claim of Mrs. Melanzana. So did they act negligently? And secondly, was whether in fact the claim against the RAF would have been successful in any event. So had Mr. Had Goodrick and Franklin brought a claim timelessly with the RAF, would the claim have been successful? With regards to the claim against the RAF, the court um, confirmed in the affirmative that the claim would have indeed been successful. And the rationale that they used was that there would have been contributory negligence on the part of one or more of the other vehicles because the truck driver did try and alert the other drivers on the road of the difficulty that he was having with regards to his truck and his braking system, and they should have heeded the distress signals of the truck driver. So the courts found 
that Mr. Mal Mrs. Melanzana would have indeed been successful with 100% of her proven claim had the claim been lodged and pursued timelessly with the REF. The court moved to the second inquiry, and that was whether Goodrick and Franklin, the defendant in this matter, whether they were actually negligent. Now, Goodrick and Franklin actually denied negligence, and in, the, in their plea, they were alleged that their failure to pursue the claim with the RAF was because Mrs. Melanzana did not provide them with sufficient information necessary to lodge the claim with the RAF. They alleged that they had made reasonable efforts to procure the information from Mrs. Melanzana, but nothing was forthcoming and this precluded them from pursuing the claim on her behalf. And the court, however, um, after considering all the evidence, found um, that this was indeed not the position, that Goodrick and Franklin did indeed have sufficient information, especially with regards to the employer information that Goodrick and Franklin um, alleged was not available. Um, the court held that they had sufficient information to complete the claim form and to lodge the claim with the RAF and to protect the interests of Mrs. Melanzana. So they found that Goodrick and Franklin had indeed been negligent and were liable for the loss um, that was sustained by Mrs. Melanzana. But a very important point that comes out of this particular judgment was the fact that the court held that and, and I've highlighted in red, it says that there comes a time when a diligent attorney has to leave the comfort zone of his or her air-conditioned office and venture out to do some field work in order to safeguard the interests of a client. Now, many may think that this is quite an onerous requirement that the courts have put on to attorneys, but basically what the courts have said is that if you agree to accept an instruction, you need to do everything that is necessary in order to ensure that the interests of your client are sufficiently protected and that the instructions are met with, with timelessly and diligently. Um, so this is a very, very important um, decision and um, it, it, it is one that we need to be uh, cognizant of um, when exercising our, our mandate. There is another case that further highlights um, the, you know, what exactly is professional negligence and um, the, the, the duties of an attorney um, in when 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 an instruction is received and yeah it, it is uh, it's important that we look at this particular case and I'll and I'll run through it um quite quickly so it is the case of Mahalit versus Standard Bank of South Africa Limited and in this particular case the appellant being Mahalit was the owner of immovable property that was situated in Santon um, the first respondent was a Standard Bank, and the second response, respondent was a conveyancing attorney. And the conveyancing attorney was responsible for the cancelling of bonds on this particular property. Now, the appellant sold the property to a third party at an agreed purchase price of 3 million rand. Of this agreed purchase price, the appellant was to receive 2.9 million rand, with a balance of 100,000 Rand being paid to the estate agent as commission. Now, the period of uh, the period for having the bonds cancelled over the property um, and for same to be transferred and for the purchase price to be paid to the appellant was a period of one year. And the appellant was extremely frustrated by this delay and instituted action in the magistrate's court in which he claimed damages against the respondent in respect um, of interest lost on the net price of 2.9 million. Now, the appellant alleged that the delay was partially caused by the unprofessional conduct of the conveyancing attorney and the, this claim was upheld and judgment was granted against the respondent in the amount of 42,000 Rand, um, which the court held was uh, the amount of damages the parties had agreed should be awarded in the event of the claim succeeding. Now, uh, the respondent, however, uh, appealed this particular judgment and um, the High Court 
set aside the court opposed ruling and substituted the order um, absolving the respondent um, of, of liability. But then the matter proceeded to the SEA and the Supreme Court of Appeal then set aside the ruling of the High Court. And the court here held that conveyancing attorneys, that the, the conveyancing attorneys were indeed held liable towards the, the appellant for the damages sustained as a result of the de delay in the registration um, of the ownership of the property in the name of the purchaser. And very importantly, uh, the court held that like any other professional, a con conveyancer may make mistakes, but that not every mistake is to be equated with negligence. And in a claim against a conveyancer based on negligence, the court said that it must be shown that the conveyancer's mistake resulted from the failure to exercise that degree of skill and care that would have been exercised by a reasonable conveyancer in the same situation. And they found that in this instance, the conveyancer was indeed um, negligent and that he was liable um, for the damages suffered by the seller due to these um, incredibly long delay. Um, so again, that speaks to what is professional negligence and what degree of care um, an attorney should take. Okay. So let's move on to risk and understanding risk a little better. So remember we said that there are various forms of risk that a firm may identify. Um, and I, in, in, during the, the beginning of my first session, I said that um, as, a, as a company, as a firm, you need, to be ident you need to identify all the risk that may present in your particular practice. I also mentioned that there will be risk that would be similar in most practices, and there may be risk that would be unique to your type of practice, but it is important to identify those risks. And risk is the possibility that an event can occur that will negatively impact the objectives of your company. And because there is this element of risk, um, it is important as a firm that we have a risk management plan. And this basically means that you need to have or you need to take proactive steps. Um, you need to put in place certain measures um, and internal procedures in order to minimize risk presenting in your practice. So again, broadly speaking, there are various types of risk and this is basically some of the, the, the types of risk that may present in a practice. Um, and that could be prescription, it could be general prescription or REF prescription, you could have under settlements, you could have misappropriation, you could have cyber. These are just a few types of risk, but there are many, many more uh, risks that a firm will be able to identify. And I just put down here the very basic and general risks that may be applicable to most um, firms. So let's look at some of the, the, you know, the type of risks that can present in different areas of our practice. Um, and these are some nuggets of risk relating to support staff. Um, it could be that a messenger files a document out of time. If this so happens, we may have a claim that could possibly prescribe. So it's very important that that this particular uh, type of risk is addressed in the form in, in your risk management plan. There could be errors in typing a document. There could be the risk of misfiling a document, failure to diarize a file or correctly note uh, the prescription date on, on a file. Um, there could be the risk of paying an incorrect beneficiary. So these are some granular types of risk that could relate to support staff. Then you could have risk um, in a convey specific to a conveyancing practice. And what could those risks be? Now, right at the bottom, I put scams. And this is, this is very important. And we've spoken a little bit about this through our sessions. Um, and I'm going to deal with it in greater detail a little bit later in my presentation. But when I refer to scams, this is basically where 
an attorney receives an instruction to pay monies into, account, into an account that is different to the account that is held by the attorney on his records. So the attorney receives an email and the, um, the email requests that the attorney pay monies into um, a, a different bank account and that bank account uh, is a fraudster's bank account and the monies are, are lost. So it's paid to an incorrect beneficiary. Now, these sorts of matters are, are extremely prevalent within um, the insurance, uh, within the attorney's world. And I see almost daily claims um, arising from these sorts of modus operandi. So it's very important that we um, are aware uh, that we have internal processes to deal with this sort of, of, of risk. Then they may be fraud by a spouse. And um, this sounds uh, quite, quite strange, uh, but I had a matter where um, the client attends at the attorney's office um, with an instruction that he wished to transfer his property. So it was a sale and he attends at the attorney's um, office with his, with, purport, with his wife, purportedly his wife. And the attorney accepts all the all the documentation, um, the ID copy, and um, commissions all the documents, and proceeds um, with the transfer of the client's property. Now, it should be noted that in this instance, in this case that I dealt with, both the husband and wife were married in community or property. The transfer occurred. The house was transferred to uh, the purchaser, and. On a day, the attorney receives a visit from the real wife. Now, what had happened was that the woman that attended at his office was not, in fact, the wife of um, the client, of the husband. It was his girlfriend, and the wife had no idea that the house was being sold and um, only became aware once transfer had taken place. Now, the information that was presented was not scrutinized by the attorney, um, and from the ID document that was received, it was quite clear that the person that presented at his office was not the person in the ID, in the ID photo or the ID that was presented to the, to the insured or the attorney. So um, as strange and as funny as this may seem, it's something that happens and something that we must be aware of. Um, and, and, and this could be a possible risk. Payment without authorization, and this is basically where we receive monies into trust and we pay monies out on the instruction of our client. Do we have the necessary and requisite authority in order to pay those monies out? So it's very important that this could be an identified risk and how are we going to deal with this type of risk? Instructions received by impersonators, this is also possibly a risk that you may have to consider. So what are the risk measures that you can put in place um, in a conveyancing practice, but I think in an attorney's practice as, as a whole, I think it's important that these measures are put in place in, in all practices. With regards to payments, it is important um, that we that, that, that you have the FICA requirements are, are considered. So in other words, um, has, you know, what are the FICA requirements that your firm has in place um, to protect you against um, risk in, in, in your firm? And remember, FICA is in terms of the Financial Intelligence Center Act, and it says that you that, that all financial institutions need to comply with FICA. Um, and as such, all attorneys need to comply with FICA. And FICA basically requires, and I think I have a slide later on, it basically says that you must ensure that you obtain uh, a copy of the ID document of your client, um, that you retain records for five years, that you report suspicious and illegal transactions, that you appoint a compliance officer. So these are, in terms of the FICA 
act what what you are required to do. So it's very important that you consider FICA and you have processes and procedures in place to deal with FICA because this is one of the miti mitigation measures that you can put in place in order to limit risk, to limit certain identified risks that we've that we've already looked at. Um, very importantly is that your FICA process should be documented. So it can't just be something that you dream up, it has to be documented. Or check who the depositor is and obtain written authorization. So when you receive monies into trust, obtain the written authorization before paying monies out. And remember to only accept payment where you are providing a legal service. I recall giving you an example early in my first session regarding um, uh, a client that approached an insured to receive monies in trust and pay on his instruction, but he failed to provide any legal services. Exactly that. Please only um, accept payments where you are providing an identified legal service. Um, legal service is defined in the LPIIF's policy as well. Okay. Um, scams, and we're going to look at that just now, fraud by sp spouses. Um, on this note, um, it is very important that I mention that um, in order to commission a document, you must ensure that the person whose documents you are witnessing must be physically present before you as the commission of oaths. Um, remember that only a commission of oaths may commission a document and take the oath. Um, and we find that many attorneys um, commission documents without having the original documents available or without actually having the person um, uh, presented before them um, before they commission the document. So be very, very careful with this. We've had many claims that arise from this, and it is on the back of all these claims that the LPIIF has now put a loading fee where a commission of oaths fails in 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 um, in complying with these requirements, and this is a 20% loading fee on the deductible schedule as contained in the LPIIF policy. Okay. What are the risk measures to combat risk of prescription? Now, prescription is a massive risk, I think, for most practices. And it is extremely important that um, as a firm, you ensure that you register um, with prescription alert. Now, prescription alert is a computerized diary system um, which records the particulars of all time barred matters. So it's not only for, or for RAF type claims, but any time barred matters can be registered with prescription alert. So essentially prescription alert is almost like a backup diary system, if you want to call it. Um, and it just reminds a practitioner about about prescription. So it's something that you as a um, as a practitioner may wish to investigate uh, and you may wish to implement with regards to your time bar mat uh, time barred matters. Also note that prescription alert is at no cost to the practitioner, so it's free of charge. And remember that where a claim prescribes, um, where an RAF claim prescribes and you fail to register with prescription alert, there will be a loading fee again on the um, on the deductible that would be payable under the LPIIF. So please remember this and take note of this. This is a very important point to remember and also important for purposes of your assignment. Um, with regards to prescription alert, it is also important that you provide prescription alert with the correct information, so the correct dates. Don't always assume three years in every instance. Um, be mindful with regards to the prescriptive period of the particular matter. Um, if you're going to use prescription alert, again, I'd say it's a backup diary system, so you shouldn't rely on it solely. You should have a normal diary system as well, and then prescription alert as an additional um, risk mitigation measure. Okay, also be very, you know, if you if you are an RAF attorney, be very mindful of RAF tactics. Um, and I, I mean, I've seen many claims where um, 
the claim is very close to prescription and there are negotiations between the attorney and the RAF to settle a claim. And whilst or during this period of negotiation, the claim actually prescribes, but the attorney fails to issue summons because the because settlement is being brokered between the RAF and um, and and the attorney on behalf of his client. And because he doesn't issue summons and the settlement does not um, the, the the settlement uh, isn't um, finalized, the REF can raise the fact that the claim is prescribed and take any settlement that they may ha may may have been considering off the table. So be very very mindful where prescription is looming and there are settlement discussions in place. Always ensure that you have regular file audits because this could be another risk measure to prevent prescription. Um, doing file audits is extremely, extremely important because all files will then be looked at and considered and any claims close to prescription may be picked up. Diary system, very important to have a dual diary system in place in order to, and, and this will again ensure that prescription does not occur. Um, have a proper delegation. Um, I, 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 I provided you with an example again uh, in my previous session of a candidate attorney who allowed claims to prescribe. Um, in that instance, there were various protocols that the attorney failed to have in place. Um, he failed to have a diary system, which if he had could have picked up that those claims um, were not dealt with and the files could have been located. If he had proper delegation, so if he had proper delegation rules and uh, had a list of all files that were delegated, um, that cl those claims would not have prescribed. So you need to ensure that you have proper delegation. And again, there must be training. Uh, training to your staff, they must have an understanding of prescription, they must have an understanding of the repercussions of them not attending to file documents timelessly, not attending to matters timelessly. So there must be an appreciation um, as to prescription. There was the case of um, Mazibuko versus Singer, which was a case that was also highlighted in the case of Melanzana versus Goodrick. And this particular matter involved the RAF claim that prescribed. Um, the attorney wrote several letters to the client. The client had not responded to the attorney. The attorney withdrew as the attorney of record and the claim subsequently prescribed. The court in Mazibuko versus Singer held that the attorney was negligent. He was negligent in that he failed to have ensured that he obtained all the information to protect the interest of his client. And in this instance, they said that the attorney should have gone to Soweto to find his client or to complete and get him to sign the necessary documents. Um, you know, it was not, um, the court held that it was not just sufficient for him to write letters and expect um, a, a response. So as an attorney, you must ensure that all communications reach your client that the client is aware of the consequences of inaction on his part and where you cannot find a client you should obtain a tracing agent. Um, I think it's important that when you accept an instruction um, that you understand who your client is um, and if it is a client that may be difficult to communicate with you need to ask yourself the question whether in fact you really want that particular client. Just a few tips. Please do not leave summons too near the prescription date. We find in many instances um, summons are issued perhaps out of the incorrect court, incorrect jurisdiction, and in order to rectify the mistake, um, the claim has already become prescribed. So allow enough time for oversights to be rectified without the added worry of prescription. Okay. Um, always follow up with the sheriff's office where summons um, has been issued and needs to be served, um, where a summons needs to be served rel relatively quickly. Uh, it is advisable to even if need be go with the, the sheriff in order to serve the summons, but to ensure that the, that the, the claim does not prescribe. 
Right, so under settlements is also a major risk and we're seeing many, many claims arising from attorneys under settling a client's claim. Now, as a risk mitigation measure, you need to ensure that you know who your client is and you need to obtain and procure all the necessary details and information relevant to your client. Beware of touts and scams, and we've seen this also in cases of medical malpractice claims. So beware of touts and, and, and scams. I had a matter where an attorney received an instruction from a tout, proceeded with the claim against the RAF, um, and attended to settle the claim with the RAF. The attorney, however, had no communication with, with his client, um, being the plaintiff or the claimant in the matter, all his instructions were received through the stout. Um, the claim was settled. Um, incidentally, the uh, client um, had a serious head injury and the claim was settled for a an amount of, I think it was 150,000 rand. And there was a claim for under settlement that was brought against the attorney. And the attorney then confessed that he had never had any dealings with this client. So he was unable to even satisfy himself as to the injury that the client had suffered. Um, had he had discussions with the client, he would have been able to ascertain that the client had a head injury and would have been alive to the fact that the settlement amount was not commensurate the injuries that this client had suffered. Very importantly, um, you need to get all medical legal reports before settling a claim and you need to canvas all aspects with your client before settling. And very importantly, all instructions have to be confirmed in writing, in writing by email, but in a way that there is documentary proof in the case that a claim is brought against an, an attorney for under settlement. With regards to settlement, the case of Goldschmidt versus Forbes is an important one. This is where an attorney failed in his, where the court held that the, that, that the attorney failed in his duty if he did not consult with his client on a proposal for settlement from the other side before answering the proposal. So very importantly, convey all offers to your client, never use a power of attorney to accept, ensure that you have all information to enable you to advise your client correctly, canvas all offers offers in depth with your client and if necessary if there is a language barrier get an interpreter interpreter confirm all discussions and instruction in writing now all these points are things that you may include in your risk management plan in order to mitigate these sort of risks another risk could be termination of mandate and how are you going to um, ensure that this risk does not present. Always remember that you must confirm a withdrawal in a registered letter or in an email. So the client must be aware of the, um, the notice of withdrawal. Always be very clear as to your timing of your termination. So you must ensure that your withdrawal is not at a, at a at a stage that would be detrimental to your client's case. Um, if a claim is close to prescribing, you need to advise your client that you are terminating your mandate, but you need to tell him um, the importance to seek the assistance of another attorney and the date that the claim needs to be um, prosecuted by the, the date that a summons needs to be served. So this has to be clear in order for him not to be caught out. In the case versus S versus Indima, this was where an attorney was not placed in funds. No counsel was instructed by the attorney and he withdrew um, from the matter on the stairs of court. And the court said that the that in this instance, the attorney was guilty of gross discourtesy and he was negligent as an officer of court because his withdrawal or termination of mandate was not done timelessly and it was done at a, at a, at a time that was not advantageous. It was not um, at, a, at a time where um, the client um, was not in a position um, to obtain uh, the services of another attorney. 
So it's very important that you withdraw timelessly or you terminate your mandate um, at, 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 at the requisite time. Okay, Hershowitz Fleonis versus Bartlett. This is another very important case that I want to discuss before um, looking at the issue of scams and payments of monies from trust. Now, if I can just go through this case, um, Bartlett um, is in, he is an attorney as well, and um, Mr. Bartlett meets a woman named Karen Hardiker sometime in 1998. And Hardiker mentions to him that there is a pending offshore gold billion transaction involving the sale of 10 tons of gold from an unnamed seller to a European company that would then be unsold to the Swiss government. Um, Mrs. Hardiker tells Bartlett that she is merely the intermediary between the seller's agent and the buyer's agent and entitled as such to a commission on the eventual sale price. Um, she also then goes on to tell Bartlett that if he puts up a goodwill deposit of around about 500,000 US dollars, an even greater commission um, would be payable to him, um, would be payable, and then they both could share this. The necessary amount or its rand equivalent, however, had to be paid into a South African attorney's trust account. Um, as Bartlett understood it, uh, the deposit would then remain in the trust account until the gold was paid for, after which it would be dispersed on his instruction. According to he, in his mind, he, he believed that if the transaction failed, the, the deposit would then be returned to him. Now, like I said, Bartlett was an attorney, he was in a commercial attorney. He had a, a, about 19 years of experience. But he had limited financial means and could not put up this 500,000 US dollar deposit or um, uh, amount that, that Hardiker re requested from him. So what he did was he borrowed it from a client and he undertook to repay the client within 60 days. Bartlett um, then pays the monies into the account of Hershowitz Fleonis. Um, but Bartlett does not tell Fleonis of the deposit or its purpose. Um, and, and the reason behind this was that Hardiker tells Bartlett not to have any communi communication with Hershowitz Fleonis. And she said to him that she would um, herself convey to Fleonis what the purpose of the deposit was. And she urged Bartlett to trust her. She was probably a very beautiful woman and Bartlett was um, uh, swayed by her, by her beauty because he did nothing and he obeyed her instructions. So on about uh, the 2nd of April 1999, Hardiker now telephones Bartlett and uh, says to Bartlett that there would be no gold billion transaction. And I think we saw this coming from the start. So on the 3rd of April, Bartlett now writes to Fleonis advising that the 3.1 million rand deposit that had been made by him um, and now tells him what the purpose of the deposit was and requests for him to repay that monies. Um, he also goes on to tell her she was Fleonis in the letter that these were clients funds and that unless the, the, unless the gold was delivered by the 6th of April, um, Hershowitz Fleonis needed to repay the monies by the 7th of April. Fleonis now answers the letter and he denies knowledge of Bartlett's allegations and he says that the monies were deposited into his trust account. Um, he, he understands that, but he also advises that these monies have been paid out of his trust account on the instruction of his client. Now, the it is, it is in, this in, in this particular case, it is not in dispute that Fleonis was negligent in dispersing the money deposited to Bartlett and that Bartlett suffered damages in the amount of 3.1 million rand as a result. But the necessary factual and legal causative links existed between negligence and damages. And the issue on appeal was the following. It was whether Bartlett was entrusted the money, whether Bartlett actually entrusted the money to Fleonis 
um, whether there was actually a legal duty on Fiona's to deal with the money without negligence and whether in fact Bartlett was contributory negligence in this instance. And the court found that the monies that were paid into the account of Hershey with Fleonis was entrusted to Fleonis by Bartlett and could not be dealt with unless he obtained the instructions from Bartlett before making payment of the monies out. Okay, so they found that Fleonis had erred in that regard. But they also found that Bartlett may have been negligent to an extent because he failed to make any inquiries. He failed to contact her. She was free owners. He failed um, to advise them of the deposit and the purpose of the, the deposit. So the court held that Hershey with Fiona's was indeed negligent. They should have obtained written instructions from Bartlett because it was easy for them to establish that the funds had come from Bartlett's account and they should have obtained his instructions before making the payment. It was not sufficient for them to accept instructions from who they deemed were their client. However, the court also held that Bartlett was, was also negligent. So the courts found Hershey with Fleonis 60% liable and Bartlett had to be at the 40% um, contributory negligence in this particular matter. So this is a very, very important case. And it's a case that we need to be mindful of when making payments from trust accounts is that do we know where the money's come, where the money's come from, who the depositor was, and do you have the requisite instructions from that depositor before paying the monies out of trust? So we spoke about scams earlier on, and that is monies received, monies held in trust and payments of these monies on the instructions of fraudulent email. Now, in terms of risk management, it is very, very important that you have an, a, a very, very good process and protocol in ter in, uh, included in your risk management plan that will deal with scams, that will deal with payments to the incorrect beneficiary. And what are the types of um, processes and procedures that you that you should have in place? One is that you must make your staff aware of these various scams. This, you know, I find that many attorneys are aware, they know about scams, but they don't filter that information through to their staff. So training is very important. There must be proper supervision. You must supervise your staff and you must check everything that is being paid. There must be proper checks and balances in place. It is important that you don't click on any email links. Um, it is important to have a proper FICA process and procedure in place because this could prevent uh, these sorts of, of payments being made to the incorrect beneficiary. Where you get instructions to pay monies into a different bank account, you may want to include um, a, a process that says that all new banking details must be verified by calling the client, the number that is on file, in order to ensure that um, they have provided that particular email instruction. You may wish to insist that where there is a change in banking details, the client needs to come to the office with the necessary FICA documents in order to verify the documents and to um, auth authenticate the new banking details that have been provided. Always remember that it may be important for you as a business to, to consider whether you have insurance in place. Remember that for these types of, of scams, there is no cover in place in, um, through the Legal Practitioners Indemnity Insurance Fund. So are you satisfied and are you comfortable that there is no cover? Or do you believe that as a, a practice, this is a risk that 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 is real. That is um, that that may present, and something you may wish to consider. And that is perhaps considering commercial crime cover, additional uh, insurance that may cover this type of risk. Um, training staff, informing clients on of cyber risks, um, and having internal security measures. So, what measures do we have in place that we could implement in order to prevent this from happening? Very important that you consider the Legal Practice Act, uh, Rule 5413, which says prior to making any such payment on file, 
Um, the firm must take all adequate steps to verify the bank account details provided by the client um, for the payment of amounts due. Any subsequent changes to the bank account details must be verified. You may wish to also consider 54.14.7, which prescribes that a firm must have appropriate internal controls. Um, I, I, I spoke about FICA requirements earlier on, and this is basically um, what FICA requires us to do. Right, in terms of your risk management measures, it is important for you to have a, a good diary system. And again, this is part of minimizing your risk. Ensure that you have a proper and efficient diary system. Um, it is very important to adopt a dual diary system. And in addition to that, register with prescription alert. Always ensure that, that you have the correct dates recorded on the files and don't always assume three years in all matters and set time aside to do your diary. Okay, file notes. Um, file notes are very important. And when we receive claims from attorneys, I often find that file notes are absent. It is very important that all, all, all communications held with a client to be to be in the form of a file note if it's not confirmed in an email or in writing. And this will just re record, record all discussions and it serves as a record of the discussion. Um, a very, very, a very uh, interesting uh, matter that I dealt with with regards to file notes. I had a claim um, that was submitted by an attorney where he was sued for under settlement. Um, now, the claim was settled for a, a specific amount, but the insured or the attorney advised um, advised us that he had he had canvassed the offer with his client and that the client instructed him to accept the offer. This particular attorney had amazing file notes. He had really, really good file notes that articulated um, the 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 uh, conversation that was held with his client, advising the client that in his view, the offer was not commensurate um, the injuries he had suffered, but confirming that the client had wished that the offer be accepted. This particular um, record of discussion was even signed by the client acknowledging that he understood and the claim was settled. So it was these file notes that was used in defense of the matter. It was a few days before the matter was due to go on trial that the attorney addressed an email correspondence through to me to say that um, he wished to withdraw his claim for indemnity because all the file notes that were used in support of his defense was fabricated. So they were not real, that he had created these file notes in order to, um, in order to create this defense. Um, now, very importantly, you must ensure that every file note that you make is clear and contemporaneous, but also that it's true and that it, 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 it properly and correctly reflects those discussions. Um, sadly, that particular matter, the um, insurers withdrew indemnity and the attorney had to deal with the matter on his own accord. Okay. I mentioned earlier file audits and the importance of file audits please ensure that you comply with this, that this is part of your risk management measure, that you attend to do a file audit every, every so often. Each firm will have their own um, requirement as to how often to do a file audit. Okay. Um, and that brings us to the end of session two. Um, there's going to be a final session that is going to be uploaded. Um, it is very important that uh, session three is um, uh, that, that that you attend session three and that you um, watch session three. We're going to deal with important aspects um, that are important for your assignment. And right at the end of that, we're going to look at the assignment question and I'm going to give you some sort of guidance as to how to answer your assignment question. I hope that the session was beneficial and I look forward to session three.